Really, Dan? Hi, guys. Hey, Dan. Hi. What's up, Dan? Ooh, Are we gonna... Good evening. Welcome to River Community Church. My name is Sam. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm gonna move some stuff. Um, thanks so much for coming here uh, this evening and being out here on a Saturday night. Um, before we get into anything, I have actually a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, if you're here, for, if you've been here for a little while, you might have heard me talk about the Saturday night list. Um, we have a special Saturday night thing that we do every, every weekend. The fact that we have a Saturday night service is, is this cool thing that we get to do every weekend. And if you're interested, um, every now and then we're going to be doing some fun things. Fun things Like tonight, after the service, uh, we're going to have a, a special worship night. So that's going to be pretty awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but for the Saturday night list, if you wanted to know about that ahead of time, you would get an email. So in a couple of weeks, on March 10th, actually, we're going to do some pizza and wings after the service. That's going to be free and just a bunch of fun, a chance to hang out. If you're interested in hearing about that kind of stuff and being reminded about it, grab the connection card in front of you, put your name and Saturday night li list and your email down, and we'll just make sure you're up to date on all those kinds of things. So that'll be really fun, uh, the worship night, and then in a couple of weeks we'll be doing the, the pizza and wings night. Um, actually, uh, tomorrow evening, there's one final housekeeping thing I want to tell you about, and that's tomorrow night we're going to be doing Epic. Um, epics are these short talks that are um, about different, uh, more in-depth topics. Uh, so tomorrow night, we're going to be talking more in-depth about the Bible. We're going to be doing Epic Bible. It's going to be at 7 p.m. right in here, uh, and it's going to be a blast. I'm really looking forward to that. There should be some more information in your programs. So that should be fun. Uh, if you're new here, if you haven't been here for a while, what you need to know is that we're in a series right now we're calling The Elephant in the Room. If you hadn't noticed, there's an elephant here. And uh, does everybody know what the elephant in the room like means? Like, do you guys understand that? Have you heard that before? Raise your hands. You've heard that term before? Yes, the elephant in the room. Uh, really, if, if you don't know, the elephant in the room is this phrase we use when there's something there. There's something taking up some space in the room, but nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to say anything about it. It's just that unspoken thing that you kind of squeeze yourself around or walk on eggshells around. It's that thing that nobody wants to talk about. Well, that doesn't really go very well here. We like to talk about those things. That's kind of like the first thing we like to talk about. So we're going to be talking about some elephants in the room. Uh, we've got a couple more weeks left in the series. Uh, this week, though, we're going to be talking about something. Uh, the elephant in the room called passing the basket. Have you ever heard of that, right? Passing the basket, it's the elephant basket. If you can't see it, it's a little hard to see. The elephant basket, passing the basket. Have you ever, like, had a basket passed by you? Like, you, you walk into Kmart and you pass by a basket that's red typically, and they're, like, jingling the bell, like, death staring you down, right? You can laugh. It's true. It's happened. You've experienced it. And you feel like, oh, it's, it's a good thing, right? I should give to this very good thing. Or now there's, like, digital baskets that they're passing, has anybody had this experience? Like you get there and you finish your purchase that you like agonized over trying to find the best deal. And then you're like paying at the register and they're like, oh, would you like to donate a dollar to like the help the homeless children foundation thing? I'm like, but I just like barely have enough money for this thing. And I'm going to feel terrible about myself if I don't give that dollar. Have any of you had that experience? Yes. Have any of you like never said no because you feel too guilty? Some people have. Well done. You're honest. That's great. I've said no a bunch, so now you're in good company, the rest of you. Um, anyways, there's this thing, right? The pass the basket thing. The pass the basket thing. In other words, we're talking about everyone that wants you to be generous. Now, last week, last week we had a special guest speaker and Tim DeMaster. If, if you missed it, you should listen to it online. Uh, but we talked about something very similar. We talked about tithing. And, and yes, this is similar, but it's different in a very important way. When we talk about tithing, a tithe means a tenth part. It's the part that God asks us to give back to him. Everything we have, we have because God gave it to us. It's ours because God allowed us to have it. So God asks us to give him back one-tenth to honor him for what he gave us in the first place. That's the tithe. Now, generosity and the basket passing, that's, that's something that's a little bit different. Generosity is different. It, it's what we do over and above the tithe. 
A tithe is, is what we give to God because it's his. Generosity is what we give because we want to give to something that matters to us, something we're passionate about. There's no guilt in generosity. You give to what you're passionate about. You don't have to give it to anything else. Now, why is this an elephant? Why is this something that's hard to talk about? Now, the first reason is, is because honestly, and this might come across a bit harsh. Don't take it this way. But honestly, you might be doing it wrong. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But stick with me as we go through it. It's an elephant in the room because you might be doing it wrong and because it deals with money. So it's this like double whammy of an elephant. There's like two elephants in here this evening. But you know who knew about this maybe more than anybody? Who also saw it as an elephant and, and could not stand the fact that, that it was going on. So he like took charge and, and addressed it himself. Jesus. Jesus did. There's this time. It, it's later in his ministry. And I think like, throughout his life, you, you'd guess that he had experienced this. He'd know that this had gone on. But when you go into the temple, there are these money exchangers. And they deal with the sacrifices and all this stuff. And, and they had done some things that Jesus is looking in and thinking, this is not good. So near the end of his ministry, Jesus grabs himself a whip and walks into this temple, the equivalent of today's church. And he begins to crack the whip and turn over the tables of these money exchangers. Maybe you're here tonight and, and you've just always thought of Jesus as a super calm, chill dude. That's just all kinds of love and good vibes and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. Maybe he was like that at times, but, but not when he was provoked to righteous anger. Then watch out. He's got a whip. You see, the people running the temple, they had done this horrible thing. This terrible thing. Jesus says this. It says, he said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. People had taken this system of sacrifice and had turned it into a money-making enterprise by systematically cheating people out of their money and possessions. So Jesus, he clears them out with a whip and he calls them a den of thieves. A den of thieves. That is what Jesus calls a religious establishment that cheats people out of their money. When we deal with and talk about money here, we do so knowing that one day we will have to face Jesus face to face. And we really don't want him to be carrying a whip. Okay? We don't want to face that Jesus. That's serious. That's why we're so cautious about how we handle money here. Uh, for example, we've never done in the 15 years of RCC a fundraiser. We've never done a fundraiser. God set up a system for how the church should run and function with tithing, and, and so we're trusting God with that system. That's how we're supposed to do it, so we're just going to do it that way. We're not going to try and complicate it. We're not going to do these really smart little things that uh, raise a bunch of money. So that's just not something we're going to do. We're going to follow God how he laid it out for us. And in addition to that, we were crazy about not going over budget. We just don't go over budget as much as we possibly can. And so because we have to stand before God one day and tell him that, that we handled his money well. And we take that super seriously. So that's what we do as a church. And, and speaking of whips, since Jesus is so serious about this, let me ask you. Do you really think about where you give your money? Like, honestly, do you think about where you give your money? And maybe even giving it at church would be wrong. Like, according to Jesus, if the church is mishandling your money, you shouldn't be giving it to a church. It says Jesus. When it comes to being generous and giving money away, do you just give because someone asked you? Like, oh, can I have some money? I mean, your kids might do that. Like, oh, 20 bucks, please. All right, here you go. Revolving door of your money, right? Or how about other areas? Like, what is a friend who asked, and, and, and maybe there's a friend who asked you, and, and you just felt like you had to, right? Like, they have this organization they're working for, and you feel like, how could I turn this person down? 
or maybe worse, maybe even more so than that, it was someone who said to you, if you don't give, it's just all going to fall apart. We are desperate for your money. We need it. We need it. Remember that first elephant I was talking to you about? That one about you maybe doing it wrong, giving it wrong? This is probably how some of you might be doing it wrong. Because you see, it feels really good to be needed. It feels really good to be needed, but that's not a good reason to give. Let me explain what I mean. Jesus says it this way. He says, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? God doesn't give more to people who are struggling with the responsibility they already have. He doesn't. God gives more responsibility to those who do well with what they've been given. So let's be clear. When you give to someone or to an organization or a person, and you are giving them more responsibility, that's what you're doing. The more funding you have, the the more you need to be diligent and responsible with what you've been given. So if we're going to give how God gives, you got your money, you got that little bit extra that you're going to be generous with, If we're going to give that away how God gives, we shouldn't give more responsibility to those who have already mishandled what they've been given. A lot of times we want to kind of put a little extra fuel on a just about to die out fire. But in reality, we should be pouring fuel on an already blazing flame or a, a thing that's about to really get started. Something that's used well, what it's already been given, and you can start to see it just fanning into this big monster flame. Like I said, it feels so good to be needed, and there are a ton of needy organizations desperate for money. But before you give, if you want your money to be a good investment, consider if they've used their resources well already and what's already been accomplished. What's already being accomplished. They've been given a couple of dollars. Are they using those couple of dollars well, or are they not? If they are, it's maybe a better investment. Do you want to you wanna do your giving? Do you want to know where your giving and your generosity is going so that one day when you stand before God and you say, this is the money that you gave me, this is the resources you gave me, the time and energy you gave me, and I spent them all this way. And do you want to be able to think like, hey, I I did my work knowing that this was a good investment for you, God? Do you want that? From my family and I, from my wife Meg and I, we um, started out married uh, eight years ago or almost eight years ago. Um, And uh, when we first got married, we had both been raised to just be frugal, right? You don't spend more than you have. You try and just buy things that are, that are needed but, but not go over the top. And so you just try and do a good job. You're frugal with what you got. And so when we got married, we didn't do a ton of budgeting. We just tried to be really smart with our money. You don't buy things you don't need. You try and be smart. You, you do all those things. And, and it worked. It worked. But a few years into our marriage, or a few years later, or excuse me, a few years ago, uh, we got to this place where we're like, we should probably look at where our money is going. And so we started to do a bit more digging and, like, looking into, like, where is this money going, when, what are we spending on what? And and we just started doing some more serious budgeting, and we realized, what in the world? There's some money going places I didn't know. Like, that's crazy. You spend on what on what? Is what she said to me. Um, (laughs) But when you think about it, right? You just don't always know where it's going. And so sometimes you just got to do that time and, and work to know where it's headed. And so we did that, and, and we got, got into it, and, and it helped. And if you're here tonight, and you're like, I just haven't done that. We've just kind of tried to figure it out and try not to spend too much money, but it just hasn't worked, or maybe you're in that spot. There's actually a class that's starting next weekend. Uh, it's in your programs. There's more information about it. But I can't tell you how invaluable it is to take that time to actually figure that stuff out. Like, the class has some great resources. It, it'll do a great job. Taking that time to go through that would be well worth the time and and investment. So I encourage you to do that if you're interested. Uh, But Meg and I, we got ourselves in order. 
Like, we figured out where we're going to be giving what money and, and what, what, where it's all going to. And then we asked ourselves, okay, now what do we want to invest in? What do we want to invest in? And I'm not talking about the stock market or, or Roth IRA or Bitcoin or some crazy thing like that. Like, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the kinds of things that we wanted to invest in because we cared about them. It was a God kind of investment. And we didn't have a ton of excess. We don't have a ton of excess, but we have this little bit. And we want to use it really well. And we had our tithe, and our tithe, which we give here. And, and then we decided on just a couple of places that we could, with a little bit of extra money, give and invest in. Because we, we saw God working there. And then we had like a little extra padding for the Girl Scouts cookies. And that just was important. But that's us, right? We had to take that time. We had to take the time to look through that. We're, we're doing our best to be faithful what, with what we've got because we take God at his word. But let's just play with that for a minute. Let's play with that for a minute. Giving money away is, is kind of hard, isn't it? Like it's, it's not very fun sometimes. If you don't have the right perspective about it, it's, it's, it's hard to part with this thing you've worked hard for. And everybody always says this thing. They always say, like, oh, if I won a million dollars, I'd give so much away. It would be so much fun, right? So let's just, let's just play with that. Let's pretend for just the, next, the rest of the sermon that you have just won a million dollars. Good for you, right? Doesn't that feel good? Like you got this. I have never seen so many smiles on so many faces. A million dollars, all right? Except I'm sorry, but there's a catch. There's a catch. You get a million dollars, and you always said you'd give so much away. Well, the catch is you have to give it all away, okay? You have one million dollars, and you have to give it all away. It sounds kind of fun, doesn't it? What would you give it to? How awesome would that be? Where would you give that million dollars? Now, if this really happened, and, and maybe it will someday. Who knows? Maybe you'll get that million dollars. But if this really happened, do you know what happened tomorrow morning? Your door will be beaten down by hundreds of people and organizations asking and pleading with you to give them that million dollars because everybody wants it. They'd be breaking down the door. Everybody would be giving you their pitch. What are you going to do with that money? How are you going to invest it? I think you should invest it here. I think you should invest it there. There's really important organizations that are trying to do really important things, and you should give us their money. That million dollars go fast. Now, if it were me, if I had that million dollars, and let's say I couldn't give it here because, because honestly, I've seen firsthand what's been accomplished here and, and with the money that's been given, and it's hard to think of a better investment. But, but if I couldn't do it here, here's what I would do. I would go find, and I've already got a few in mind because I've been thinking about this all week. I'd go and find a great church, a church with tremendous leadership, following God's lead in every single area, doing good things and good work, and I'd literally give them every penny. Do you know why? It's not just my opinion. I know you think it probably is, but it's not just my opinion. We live in a world, as we're made ever more aware, filled with the evils of hopelessness and misplaced anger and abuse and hunger and mistreated and neglected mental illness and homelessness and injustice. We live in a world filled with evil, and God makes it clear in the Bible what his plan is to deal with that evil between now and when he one day comes and makes it all right. Here's his plan. And I'm going to ask you to see if you can catch it. It's all over the Bible, and, and the full verses that I'm going to be pulling from are actually on your program. But it's in there. See if you can catch it. It's in Hebrews, it says, think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And then it says in Hebrews, let us not neglect meeting together. And in Ephesians, it says, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. And then he says, each part does its own special work. And he says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more like Christ. And then in 1 Peter, it says, you are a chosen people, God's very own possession. He says, you can show others the goodness of God. In Acts, it says, when it's talking about this, this group of people, it says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, 
And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. And it says they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. And it says they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. And it says each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Did you catch it? God has a plan for hunger and poverty. God has a plan to give people hope. God has a a plan to thwart the rampant evil in this world. And in case you didn't catch it, it's you and me. It's his church. The church shows the world Jesus. Jesus transforms. There is no better investment. I think that's why Jesus flipped tables and and cracked his whip. Those people had messed up this system that was supposed to show God's goodness to the world, and it was getting really messed up. Let's go back to that million dollars that you don't have yet, but maybe someday. Everyone is going to be knocking on your door trying to give you their pitch. Now, I've got you before you get the million dollars. That's important. So when that happens someday, you can remember this. So I want to give you my pitch. But I I want you to know before I do, this is not something I like to do. And I'm not really, as I've been thinking about it all week, giving a pitch for me. The, The reality is you need to know what God has accomplished through this church. So you can know that your million dollars won't find a better investment. So here it is. And honestly, it's really humbling to say these numbers because because God's done just the most incredible things here. In the last 15 years, 500 people have been baptized. More than that. Well over that. 15 years. Nearly 200 infants through high schoolers are here weekly learning about God's love. Five to six hundred adults hear a message of hope and God's forgiveness here every single week. That's unprecedented in a town of 7,000 people. We provide a multitude of small groups for a bunch of things, but including groups that deal with grief and groups that that, that experience uh, divorce. We we have a chaplain's ministry that reaches hundreds in pain and, and, uh, and joy. The church started with what's now a standalone thrift store and food pantry, what we now call Traded Treasure, that that feeds hundreds of families every month. Not every year, every month. We started a coffee house eight years ago that that now owned by some amazing people that that attend RCC, serves as a safe and vibrant community hub for Ripon. We've helped launch two church plants in the Midwest and contributed to multiple others. We've contributed to the amazing movement happening in India through church plants that are fighting for child literacy, education, and safety, and fighting human trafficking by giving women dignified, fair, and good work. And the list goes on and on and on. We just don't have time. But the bottom line is this. In our taking serious and are taking seriously the responsibility God has entrusted us with, God has accomplished unbelievable things. If you were to give your million dollars to RCC when, it, when you get it someday, you would be investing in something that has impacted not only this community, but also the Midwest and stretched to every single corner, a bunch of different corners of this world. And in big ways... It's really because of all of you. That's you guys. You've served your tails off. You've been the kind of church that welcomes people. You guys excel in so much. The the strength of this church has always been all of you. It's been the people. The standard here for everything has always been excellent, right? Excellent music, excellent children's and student ministry, excellent pastoral care, excellent teaching, excellent groups and learning opportunities, and and even excellence in those kind of intangible things, the things you can't quite quantify, the the love that we have, the forgiveness that's here, the, the being welcomed through those back doors in a way that most people don't experience in a lot of places. That's our church because of you. But if I'm honest with you, when it comes to giving, and, and Tim, the master who taught last week, alluded to this. And when I heard him say it, it was kind of a, a take back. Like I didn't think about it until he said it. But it surprised me that when it comes to giving, he's right, we're average. 
when it comes to giving, that, that's just where our church is at. Let me ask you, why would we ever settle to be average in this one area? There's this verse that Paul writes to this church, and I feel like it could be written directly to us. It's 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 8. Since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. It's not a commandment. But I'm competitive. So when I think about those other churches, I don't want any church in the world to be as devoted to God and to have that kind of love for what he's accomplishing as we do. Bottom line is this. God has accomplished so much through this church in the past 15 years. And I believe he's blessed us because of our faithfulness. But we're just getting started. And if we're going to reach for what God could accomplish through us, we can't be average in our faith in any single area. We have to excel in all of them. Because people, can, can you just imagine with me? For just a second. Can you just imagine with me the next 15 years? Can you imagine the next 15 years if we chose to be faithful in this area too? In a world where young men choose to do unspeakable, horrendous things, we could expand our children's and youth ministry to reach more of Ripon's kids with God's love. Imagine our school system infected with kids who love Jesus. Imagine the real and tangible difference that would make here. I'm actually excited. We're going to announce something about Saturday night children's things soon, in a couple weeks. I can't wait for you to hear about it. But imagine that. Imagine expanding it. Imagine being part of planting new churches in nearby towns that are desperate about the hope that Jesus brings. And it's there. Believe me, it's definitely needed in these towns. Imagine having counseling services av available here at RCC. If there's one thing that is desperately needed here in this town, it's that of professional counseling. There's a request all the time, and we have a couple of resources, but not enough. Can you imagine having one on staff? There's, there's literally no thing that is requested or needed here more than that on a weekly basis. Imagine meeting the medical needs of our community with a free clinic for those who need it. Could you? We could do that. It's possible. Imagine helping plant more churches in India or Honduras or wherever else. Imagine being able to expand or build so that we could reach more people with this love of Jesus here in Ripon and all over the Fox Valley. I mean, these are pipe dreams. But they don't have to be. Imagine the church being the church in Ripon, Wisconsin. Imagine the impact here and the reverberating effects through the Fox Valley in Wisconsin and all over the world. It's actually possible. And you can be part of it, but only if we excel in giving too. And I know you don't really have the million dollars, or, or maybe you do and you just haven't told me. Let's talk afterwards. That'd be fun. But in spite of that, nobody here needs the million dollars. In spite of that, you should know this. It's possible even for a church in little old Ripon, Wisconsin, to have that kind of impact and more. Actually, if you look at the numbers, it really is. If, if you look at it conservatively, um, if you just average the, the average household, or use the average household income for, for a year in Wisconsin, and you apply that to how many people come to church here, uh, very conservatively, that's $2.5 million a year. We're nowhere near that right now. If everybody tithed. If people tithed. Imagine what God could do through RCC when we faithfully use that money well. Because we will. We, we've shown it. I'm not even talking about generosity. If we just did that basic thing God talks about. Suddenly those pipe dreams aren't pipe dreams anymore. They're reality. And they're powerful. 
Wouldn't you love to be part of that kind of church, a church that excels in everything, to get to heaven one day and to meet Jesus face to face and have him recognize you for excelling in everything and for you to be able to have so much joy because you could see for yourself the effects of your investment, the people who were touched and impacted by your gracious act of giving. I can't imagine that. I can't wait to experience it. If you're here tonight and you're not ready, if this is going to get in the way of you getting to know Jesus, disregard everything I've just said. Almost everything. Not the part about what this church is all about. Don't worry about giving. Come, be here, get to know Jesus, but disregard, don't disregard what this church is about. But if you're here and you believe in and are trying to follow Jesus with your life, then I want to challenge you to excel in this too. Take a good hard look at your finances and see what it would take to tithe. Then take a risk with eternal as well as right here and, and right now payoffs. And maybe you don't trust us here yet. If that's the case, don't just think that. Let's sit down and talk about it face to face. No questions are off limits. Let's talk about it. Finally, if you're here and you already tithe, feel free to be generous. Here or wherever you feel so moved. Because that's your free money. That's the chance to do whatever you want to, to give back to God or to give to an organization you're passionate about. I'm going to say, just why not here? I just don't think there's a better investment. But that's just me. You can do whatever you want with that. It's guilt-free giving completely. It's a chance for you to do what God's leading you to do. And it's awesome because it covers so many different things. You're probably sitting here tonight and you're thinking to yourself, who, who is this guy? Because you don't know me to be this bold, especially about money. And I'm normally not. Like, this is weird for me. But this week, I kept on thinking about the terrible news stories out there about shootings and just all the ugly stuff. And I kept thinking, what should our response be? Because everybody's saying there's a thousand different responses you're supposed to give, and I'm feeling like maybe I should have a response or something. Because honestly, words and the routine prayers, it seems routine now, they don't seem to be doing much around about this, this stuff. And then I went to work thinking about generosity and tithing for this sermon and what it's all about and the implications, and I realized something. And it kind of made me a little angry. You can talk to Mike later. I told him I was angry this week. The church's response should be the boldest response it can possibly muster. The church's response should be to be the church. To be the church and excel in every single area of worship. Because when we do, we'll reach the world with the message of Jesus that can actually transform and thwart this evil in the world. Is there anything more crucial than that? Anything more worth investing in than that? So why not do it? Why not? And here's how you can start. These are some next steps for you. The first is this. Keep coming. It said in, in the Hebrews verse, do not neglect meeting together. That's, that's first and foremost. Keep being here, whether you give or not. Don't ever let a talk about giving or generosity keep you from getting to know Jesus. Seriously. So keep on coming. Number two, if, if you follow Jesus and you're not at the place of tithing yet, then maybe that's your next step. That is your next step when it comes to money and according to the Bible. See what that would take. But what you need to know when you do this is not only are you blessed by God for taking this step, but God is also blessing and impacting a community and world because of your act of obedience and faith. It's just all around good and powerful. And then number three, if you're here and you are tithing and you're, you're faithful in that way, then have fun being generous. Like have fun. 
Think about it. Like your investment in whatever you think you're, you're, you're passionate about, whether it's here or somewhere else, is something you get to go to God one day and be like, I invested in that. Look what happened. How cool. How awesome. And you could show how diligent you were in that. It would be amazing. We're here tonight, and I know this is one of those topics that's literally an elephant in the room. It's uncomfortable to talk about. That's okay. I think it's awesome, actually. Because this is a place where we're just going to talk about it. And we're going to be as real as we possibly can. As I was thinking about this message all week, and believe me, this is one of those ones that you just can't get off your mind. I couldn't help myself of thinking what was possible and what God might do. And it got me really excited. It also got me really nervous. I want this for us. But you have to want it too. You have to want God's will to be done in here because we excel in every area of worship. Every area. And I would be floored and so excited to see God work here. It, it would just be awesome to be part of that. So as I close, uh, I'm just going to ask God that um, he would give us the courage to move in this way. That he would give us the courage for, for how we're supposed to, to follow him and to do it. And then that he would give us this amazing chance to experience him working in powerful ways and know that we were part of it. I want that for us. I want that for you. That's a great investment. Would you pray with me? Dear God, I am so utterly grateful that, <laughs> that you do amazing things with whatever we give you. It's so evident here. Uh, it's so evident in the ways that these people serve and love and welcome people. This place that that's a, a, we call a church because a bunch of people that love you are meeting here. It's done amazing things because of these people, God, and, and them being honoring to you in the ways that they serve and love and welcome and, and, and so much more. In the ways that they've already given. But God, I, I ask that we would never be done. That there would never be enough that we would see something on the horizon of what you're doing and go after it and be excited to be part of it. Because I can only imagine, I can't, I can't hardly imagine what's, what you're capable of. Help us to be part of that, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.